We move now to a more practical matter of how to actually solve the P1 problem. As we are about to show, P1 is a special case of a wider family of optimization tasks known as linear programming. This family of problems minimize a linear expression with respect to the unknown x, subject to a linear constraint coupled with the requirement for non-negativity of the solution. The reason we are so excited about tying P1 to linear programming, LP, is the fact that there are many available and efficient tools for solving LP problems. For example, there is an instruction in MATLAB named LinProg doing exactly that. So let's build this bridge between P1 and LP. The key idea is to split the unknown into positive and negative entries. The split suggests to represent x as u minus v, where both u and v are non-negative vectors. u takes all the positive entries from x, and v takes the negative ones. Here is an example to illustrate this split. Notice how u took the positive blue entries, v took the negative ones in red, and both u and v are non-negative. Notice that the supports of these two vectors do not overlap, causing their inner product to be zero. Now, armed with this split, let's reformulate the P1 problem. First, the L1 norm is nothing but a direct sum of the entries in U and V, and thus it can be posed as a linear expression with respect to U and V. Second, the linear constraint AX equals B can be written differently to reflect the fact that X equals U minus V, again leading to a linear form. One last thing, we must force U and V to be non-negative to follow the split we suggested. With these steps, we get a new and equivalent description of P1 in terms of the vectors u and v. So how does this new form look like? Here it is. And as can be seen, it has a linear programming structure. However, there is one difficulty. We have failed to force u and v to be orthogonal to each other, something fundamental to our split. However, if we do add this as a constraint, we will lose all the elegance of the new formulation. So what shall we do? As we are about to show, the last requirement is not really needed. Here is a theorem that states this very fact, saying that this orthogonality constraint is a passive constraint. This implies that with or without it, we get the same solution. Let's turn to prove this claim. Assume that we have found the optimal solution and it violates the orthogonality condition. This implies that there is an overlap in the supports of u and v. That is, at least in one location, both have a non-zero value. Let's just assume that it is the first entry that is causing this problem, with values u1 and v1 in these two vectors. We shall further assume that u1 is bigger than v1, and that v1 itself is positive as well. In that case, we could replace u1 by u1 minus v1, and replace v1 by zero. With these replacements, the constraints are not affected, and the penalty, which sums the elements of u and v, gets smaller by twice v1. This means that we manage to create an alternative feasible solution with lower penalty value, a fact that contradicts our assumption that the starting u and v were optimal. This proves that the optimal solution must obey the orthogonality even if this is not explicitly forced, just as claimed. 